Hello, good afternoon to all of you and welcome. I'm here for introducing fifth Dabulkal uh, Kalburgi uh, Annual uh, Memorial Day 2017. Dr. Narendra Achut Dabulkar was an Indian rationalist and the author from Maharashtra. He was a qualified medical doctor having obtained MBBS from the government medical college, Miraj. He became involved with movements for social justice and gradually started focusing on eradication of superstition and joined the Akhil Bharatiya Andhasraddha Nirmulan Samiti, which founded by Dr. Shyam Manav. In 1989, he founded Maharashtra Andhasraddha Nirmulan Samiti, we know as MANAS, Committee for Eradication of Superstition in Maharashtra, and campaigning against superstition, confronting dubious tank tricks, and claim holy man who promised miracle cures for ailments. He criticized the country's good man, god man, self-styled Hindu ascetics who claim to perform miracles and have many followers. He was the founding member of Parivartan, a social action center located in Satara district, Maharashtra, that seeks to empower marginalized members of community to lead life of security, dignity, and prosperity. He was a closely associate with the Indian rationalist Sanal Eda Maruku. He also served earlier as a vice president of Federation of Indian Rationalist Associations. Uh, under his supervision, Manas drafted an anti-superstition bill, anti-Jadutona bill, and a black magic ordinance. Uh, triggered by his murder, 20 August 2030, the pending anti-superstition and black magic, or, uh, black magic ordinance was uh, promote, promulgated in state of Maharashtra for uh, four days later. I will happy to say that uh, I personally know uh, Dr. Dabulkar and uh, work with them. Uh, we did street plays on awareness about uh, the superstition. Uh, we organized seminars and uh, uh, workshop across Maharashtra on the uh, uh, superstition and the uh, anti-Jadutona uh, bills awareness. And also did a magic show showing to people what is a scientific method and what is a reality hidden behind the uh, magic. The work of uh, Manas is uh, progressing with a good pace. Branches increases from two to, uh, 200 to 300, uh, 315 since last four years in Maharashtra. Also, Karnataka, Karnataka is in the process of following in Maharashtra's full step to uh, passing these types of bill, like uh, anti superstitions bill. Approximately 350 cases register under the anti superstition. Uh, and black magic bill in Maharashtra. Uh, under the Manas supervision, passing of one more law in Maharashtra, that is Maharashtra protect of people from social boycotts, prevention, uh, prohibition, and redress act 2016. Uh, the murder of Dr. Dabulkar shocked some of us rather badly. A lecture series was uh, instituted lecture in the memory of Dr. Dabulkar. In 2050, uh, after Professor M. M. Kalburgi was killed in much the same way, and the name was also added to the lecture series. According to the Article 51 slash H in, uh, in the uh, Indian Constitution, every citizen has to due to pro uh, every citizen has the duty to promote scientific temper, humanism, and spirit of inquiry and reform. Doing this, Dr. Narendra Dabulkar and Professor Kalburgi fell to the bullets of assassins. To remember the brave efforts of the rationalists, their work, a lecture series, was started in Ajim Prem University since 2013. Uh, the first lecture was delivered in May uh, uh, in uh, 2030 by Ms. Mukta Dabolkar, daughter of Dr. Narendra Dabolkar, and the activist on the work of Manas. The second lecture was delivered by Professor Sundar Sarukai, philosopher, on scientific and ethical rationality in November 2014. The third lecture was delivered by Professor Gopal Guru on understanding soft and hard, uh, and hard irrationalism in October 2015. The fourth lecture was delivered by Sushil Joshi, who is a science editor and author on the topic of science education in the absence of scientific culture in November 2016. The fifth lecture to which we Welcome to all of you as being delivered by Professor Romila Thapar, historian and public int uh, intellectual 
from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Dr. Rumila Thapar uh, is Professor Emirates at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, born in 1931 uh, at Lucknow. After graduating from Punjab University, Dr. Thapar earned her uh, PhD from School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in 1958. In her vast body of work are included books on Ashoka and the Disline of the Mauryas, Ancient Indian History, Asian Indian Social History, Some Interpretations, The Aryans Recasting Constructs, The Past Before Us, Historical Tradition of Early North India, and The Past as Present, Forging Contemporary Identities Through History, and the recent book based on a long interview with her, Talking History. Uh, and today's lecture title of Professor Thapar is Shaping Identity, Nationalism, Secularism, and democracy. So I would like to request to Professor Romila Thapar and uh, Professor uh, Rohit Dhankar come over the stage and deliver her thoughts. Welcome again, friends, and welcome, Professor Thapa. Uh, this is a very important occasion for us when a scholar of uh, Professor Thapa's eminence is speaking on a very pertinent issue in the national politics at the moment. Uh, we have been trying to invite Professor Thapa for the POE conference as well, uh, but both the times we approached her at that time, once I think she was traveling outside and another time she had some other engagement. Uh, but I think this is a great occasion. Uh, I wouldn't stand between you and Professor Thapar's enlightening lecture, uh, would say one or two things. Uh, this morning I was thinking that perhaps I was one of the most inappropriate people in this university to chair this particular session because my understanding of either history or uh, identity formation uh, is, is not of that level. Uh, but, mm, I agreed because Bhupenji asked it long back and at that time it sounded very distant. So one, one doesn't you know, think much about that. Uh, now what I'll do is that uh, we have this tradition of having very informal kind of or very limited role for the chair. So I'll reduce the role of the chair to helping Professor Thapar at the end of the lecture to notice the hands of the people who will raise, their, raise the questions. And with that, I would invite Professor Thapar to begin her lecture. Thank you. So, uh, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> yeah, it's better if I stand, if I have this. just shows you that I do not understand modern technology. I don't know what to do with two mics. Uh, anyway, you've really done me a very great honor by asking me to speak on an occasion that memorizes Lareda Dhabolkar and Professor Kalbulki, both of whom upheld the rational and scientific understanding of the world in which we live. I was concerned about what I should speak on since I really don't know very much about the whole question of how superstition and magic um, features in our lives except for the obvious things, does feature a great deal. Um, so I deci decided that I should maybe speak on a subject which concerns a lot of us these days, which is very much being discussed, uh, but not sufficiently discussed. It's being mentioned, but it's not being sufficiently discussed. Uh, basically, the question of nationalism and also what is integral to nationalism, which is the idea of 
a secular society and a democratic society. Uh, I can only present a very partial comprehension of the change and the flux that we're going through at the moment and try and explain historically what the reasons for this might be. It does require us to see the change, not just in a limited Indian context, but in a much more um, wider uh, context of many other societies that have also gone through or are going through this change. I shall speak, therefore, on three connected concepts that are central to our public life and about which I think there is a fair amount of confusion, and I don't for a moment hope to clear the confusion, but I think that I should lay it before you and uh, suggest that one should be talking about these things and clearing one's confusion. We can discuss them, the three concepts, and hope to get some clarity. And the concepts are, as I mentioned, nationalism, secularism, and democracy. And today, especially today, these need to be debated as widely as possible. Let me begin then by attempting to explain what my thoughts are on them. And you may agree or you may well disagree. What is nationalism? The simplest answer is that it emerges at a point in history generally connected with the historical changes as of the last couple of centuries. Among these changes are the obvious ones that everybody speaks of, the rise of a middle class in a society, industrial technology, elements of economic capitalism, ideas of social equality and social justice, and such like. These did not exist in earlier times, before two or three hundred years ago. These certainly did not exist in times when parts of India were called Aryavart or Jambudweep or Bharatvarsh or Al Hind. Nationalism was absent then because the historical context required for nationalism to emerge was also absent. And I am very strongly emphasizing uh, the need to look at the historical context when nationalism uh, emerges. The idea of nationalism brings together the people of contiguous territories who believe that they are connected. They claim common origins, a shared history, religion, and language. And these, despite some diversities, are seen as uniting people. Above all, there is a political aspiration to a better joint future. That is the justification for a new society and a new nation. And above all, there is a political aspiration to this future in which history becomes central to these claims. Historical origins in nationalist thinking generally have to go back to one root and history has to be common. History written in the modern world provides these common origins. I can here repeat what Eric Hobsbawm, the historian of modern Europe, stated, that history is to nationalism what the poppy is to the opium addict. It is the source that justifies the idea of a nation and of nationalist thinking. And there's really much more truth to the statement that would seem so from <laughs> the quotation. But there is a competition among sections of society for controlling the discourse on nationalism. This leads to variations in the discourse. In India, we had anti-colonial nationalism competing with religious nationalisms, or what are often called religious nationalisms. Historical origins are intensely debated 
and it's understandable why in this period more than ever, because some use them to justify their claim to identities, on which claims they build their power. History is presented in different ways in accordance with the varieties of nationalism that are being endorsed. Those historians, therefore, who insist on checking the reliability of their sources and whose readings are more secular have to be always much more alert about the use that is being made of the past and of these claims, which is why some of us get into serious trouble with some other people who are not historians. Earlier independent states get realigned into a new potential state through the process of nationalism. Some, some refer to the new state as the nation state. Kingdoms of previous times can be realigned to form the new nation, as happened both in Europe and in India. Many ceased to be monarchies and became democratic republics, as in France. Some continued as monarchies, but with heavily curtailed power in favor of a democracy, such as in Britain. The earlier boundaries of kingdoms could undergo change, as when the Mughal Empire was replaced by the British Indian Empire, with further alterations after Indian independence, the creation of Pakistan and Bangladesh. This historical change usually coincides with the emergence of a middle class. A new kind of economy and society takes shape. The technology moves from a focus on agriculture and the activities of merchants to a change in technology that tends towards industrialization. This in turn brings in industrial capitalism, controlled by some of the erstwhile elites, but more so now by the middle class, the new middle class. An example of this process of change is perhaps seen most clearly in the history of Britain in the last three centuries. And this was to have an impact, inevitably, on the modern history of India through colonialism. Societies that mutate into nations go through a process whereby the multiple earlier communities and identities of pre-modern times are gradually given less prominence or else are just generally amalgamated. A new national identity emerges. It is often asked whether the theory of nationalism is something tangible, or is it an intangible idea that is powerful in bringing communities together in a new way? Benedict Anderson, for example, um, argues that in fact it creates, it is intangible and it creates an imaginary community, which is an interesting argument um, in terms of the claims that are made about the reality of nationalism uh, as a tangible development. However, even as such, even as an imagined community, the idea leads to new social and political forms. The nation state is very different from the kingdoms of the past. And this is something we must keep in mind. That it is new is symbolized in the self-perception of people. They no longer see themselves, or they should no longer see themselves, as the subjects of the king, what we refer to as the praja of the raja. They must see themselves as citizens of a state. And this change from subjects to citizens is an essential aspect of nationalism that we do not underline enough in our discussions of Indian nationalism. The community identity that people had in previous times, such as identities of religion, language, ethnicity, whatever, have to give way to a new identity, that of the nation and the citizen. 
this is a very substantial change uh, that we must should, should be aware of. This mutation from subject to citizen is a qualitative change. If it is not properly defined, either by accident or deliberately, then the earlier identities linked to communities, to multiple individual communities, remain the primary identity. In a nation, such identities are accommodated, but are not any longer primary. So there's a difference between accommodating the earlier identities and treating any one of them as the primary identity, rather than introducing the new primary identity, which is that of the citizen. They continue the earlier identities, but as subordinated to the new primary and overarching identity of being citizens of the nation. <clears throat> the growth of anti-colonial nationalism in colonial societies brought in a significant change when the colonized people became familiar with the idea that they, even as underprivileged people, could demand representation. And that is, as we all know, how the national movement began. Together with this came democratic rights and social justice. It had been argued in Europe that liberal and democratic forms were essential to the nation state. And this encouraged the freedom of expression in every field and even the orthodoxy was questioned. Removing social inequalities led to theories of social justice and challenging the idea that the world and all its creatures, including humans, was created by God, led to theories of evolution, which suggested an alternate explanation. Such thinking encouraged explorations of scientific knowledge. These debates in Europe also made an impact on the educated in the colonies, and such ideas combined with the iniquities of colonial control, and they strengthened the anti-colonial nationalism in the colony. This naturally posed a dilemma for the colonial powers. The claim was that European civilization made Europe superior to the colonized world. But this knowledge in the hands of the educated people amongst the colonized enabled them to question colonial control. The idea of a nation and what it implied in terms of social and political change also spread amongst the colonized and gave power to anti-colonial movements. Freedom from colonial control raised questions regarding other kinds of control in India, namely the control of religious laws and caste observances. In a sense, anti-colonial nationalism gave shape to a wider nationalism in India. Indian nationalism implied that the older identities of religious, caste, and language communities would gradually have to give way to a secular identity, that of the Indian nation and citizen. Now, I am tagging the two together, and I am arguing that these changes that we are undergoing will bring about a new identity. The idea of an Indian nation started to become real. There was a link between the idea of India and the idea of the Indian citizen, both of which were historically new experiences. This is rather beautifully summarized, I think, if one does a comparative reading of uh, Gandhiji's book, Hind Swaraj, and Nehru's discovery of India. This is the kind of period in which they're talking about what the new society is going to be. They have very different views on the subject, but it's an interesting exercise. What was the idea of India on which so much has been written in the last 50 years? It has been seen essentially as the evolving and defining of the Indian nation. In terms of territory, it was a country ruled by the British. It consisted of a multiple body of people currently maintaining a difference of languages, castes, religions, and cultures. 
They had a shared history with new people entering at many points in their older history and contributing to the culture and to the patterns of life. Both the differences as well as agreements can be traced back to this shared history. And this is another reason why the exploring of the past is so significant and the whole notion of how we explore the past. Anti-colonial nationalism gave a shape to at least the idea that the Indian citizen should be the primary category of the Indian nation. This meant that the older identities of language, religion, and caste that had once been the primary identities were not to be discarded, but to be subordinated to the new and primary identity of the citizen. This allowed religious and other identities to be part of what one might call the substratum cultures, but insisted that the identity of the citizen have primacy and be secular. It had to if it was going to rise above all these other identities. It had to be secular in order to distance itself from the narrower community identities. This perspective was contradicted by the colonial insistence that India consisted not of one nation, but of two, the Hindu nation and the Muslim nation, each based on identity with the specific religion. This is an idea which James Mill put forward and it became absolutely basic to all colonial thinking. The colonial projection was a travesty of the idea of nationalism. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it was successfully planted in the Indian mind through colonial policy, and it took root, as we know from today's politics. Yet in theory, it was rejected by many among anti-colonial nationalists as well, since religious identities were contrary to secularism and secularism was seen as the foundation of the nation. We might remind ourselves as to what was the idea of India at the time of independence. It was being shaped by this new relationship between the Indian citizen and the emerging Indian nation. The relationship was based on the duties, obligations, and rights that each, the state and the citizen, had towards the other. Such a relationship had not existed before, since much of governance was based on precedent and convention. These duties and rights had to be set out in a constitution, and this would ensure their security as long as the constitution was protected. One of the first acts of the independent government was to establish a constitution. The constitution that created the Republic of India and its democratic structure was a basic feature of the Indian nation. Therefore, attempts to change the constitution cannot be taken by us lightly. Suggested changes and their implications have to be discussed down to the smallest detail. Citizens rely on parliament and the judiciary to protect the constitution. It is equally incumbent on the judiciary and the government to ensure that the rights granted by the constitution are in fact protected. Sometimes this is done, but sometimes the action is contrary to the constitution and has therefore to be questioned. The state performs its duties through its governance and administration. Through this, it should protect the rights of the citizen. These, at a minimum, are the right to life, livelihood, health, education, social justice, and the equality of status. If these rights are insured, then the citizen would be expected to perform his or her duties to assist in the perpetuation of these rights. If they are not insured and not effective, then there will be a legitimate demand by citizens that they be made so. The rights of citizens today cannot be taken for granted. 
We forget that the implementation of these rights for all citizens, all citizens, irrespective of their previous identities of religion or caste, are crucial to the functioning of the nation. They are not meant to exist only in theory or only for the economic and political elite, but for all citizens. We have yet to arrive at the point of governance when this is so. Admittedly, these rights are not absolute and incontrovertible in every nation today all over the world. But it would help, it would help us if we were higher in the ranking of nations that do implement these rights. The identity of the citizen as a member of a nation has to be the central identity above all others and is therefore of necessity a secular identity. That this should be guaranteed requires a substantial change in social and political attitudes from earlier times, both amongst those being governed and those governing. It's not enough just to say that the people must change their attitudes. Those that are governing the people often have to change their attitudes to a much greater extent. In earlier times, the differences of caste and religious sects that define communities encouraged diverse identities of unequal status. Many of these will continue for a while, although identities do mutate with historical change. There is really no such thing as a permanent identity. A national identity does not require anyone to give up a religious or caste identity, but the obvious difference from earlier times is that the primary identity has to be that of the secular citizen. The new identity of the citizen has to be created, nurtured, and given primacy. This basic fact is unfortunately either not understood or else is deliberately ignored. Yet this is what anti-colonial nationalism was trying to implement in the early years after independence before it was thwarted by other ideologies and activities. Once the colonial power was removed, there was an attempt to establish a secular nationalism. It was diverted through the many struggles for power and a new economic elite that emerged. The dominance of the upper castes was being reasserted in various ways. Identity politics focused on the aspirations of religio-political groups and attempts are still made to revive and encourage the strengthening of community identities based on distinctly separate religion and in accordance with colonial readings of Indian society. Secular nationalism, emphasizing the equal status of all citizens, did not receive adequate attention in the early years after independence. These were the values that we had cherished before independence and just after, since they were to be the making of a new society of citizens of equal status. But this has not happened. We have to ask ourselves then why this has not happened. We have lost sight of the fundamental change inherent in creating a modern nation, namely the rights of the citizen in relation to that nation. But we seem to have deserted even the values of our earlier identities, such as the religious, because we no longer admonish those that destroy these values. For example, do we have a veneration for human life, a value that in theory is held high by all religions? <clears throat> the assassin of Gandhi is honored. Statues are put up to him and garlanded. Those speaking on, of rationalism are murdered. Young and old are lynched for belonging to the wrong religion or the wrong caste or non-caste. 
People merely stand around to watch the lynching. Is lynching acceptable to religious ethics? Or is this apathy born from the fear that in trying to prevent the killing, one may in turn be killed oneself? Or is it out of sheer unconcern for the other human being? And religious organizations have been remarkably silent on these issues and not really made any comment on this change. If human life has little value, then how do we try and invest it with value once again? <coughs> not by upholding money and power as the true aims of life. We are in fact currently facing not just an economic crisis, which is much talked of, but also an ethical crisis and moral apathy, which unfortunately is not talked of. Nationalism does not lie merely in shouting slogans, nor is the shouting of slogans the test of patriotism. Nationalism lies in helping to build a just society with a guarantee of at least a minimum livelihood for all. It lies in making citizenship a viable reality. We have dropped back into the politics of communities identified by religion and caste, as was taught to us by the colonial interpreters of our history and culture. Much less attention is given to the rights of citizens and the removal of social injustice. We have to ask ourselves, therefore, how did this happen? To simplify the narrative, let me say that the problems of deviating from nationalism by revitalizing divisive identities began to germinate in about the 1920s, to go back to a bit of history. There were many strands using the label of nationalism and competing for power, and they're still competing for power. They spoke of the varieties of nationalism. What were and are these varieties? And are they all nationalisms? The most significant, and many would argue, the most legitimate form of nationalism was what inspired anti-colonial nationalism. It incorporated the mass movement started by Gandhi, bringing in people from rural and urban areas. Gandhi used satyagraha, or civil disobedience, or passive resistance, as a way of activating nationalism. This form of protest was familiar to the pre-modern societies of India. That's a connection that we seldom make, that this was really a very traditional way of protesting. And we should go into the question of how it was, it was so. This form, um, its history is tied into the shamanic tradition, particularly, of the Buddhists, the Jains, the Ajivakas, into the rationalism of the Charvakas and others, who questioned religious orthodoxy and its social norms, and spoke, in fact, much more of social equality. They had proposed alternate ways of achieving a more meaningful society. The ambiance of these movements had trickled through the centuries and into our times. Anti-colonial national, nationalism mobilized people against the injustices of the colonial regime. This inspired a vision of establishing a just and social, a socially equal society, superior to that which had been shaped by colonial rule. We need to ask why this thrust towards a different society did not happen in post-independence times. The other two varieties of nationalism that were to become political players took the form of the Muslim League and the Hindu Mahasabha and their successors. Both give primacy to religious identities, the primary citizen in the first case being Muslim and in the other, Hindu. They both rose as alternatives to the secular anti-colonial movement with which they disagreed. 
They drew on the historical interpretations of James Mill and his colonial successors, who had argued for the existence of two separate nations that were permanently hostile to each other. These two movements supported the idea of religion-based nationalism. This meant that the primacy of citizenship was determined by the religious identity. But giving primacy to religion denies equal rights of citizenship to all, irrespective of religion. Large numbers of people are therefore excluded, which is why there are political scientists who've argued that this should not be called nationalism. However, that's a debate. Ideologies of the identity politics of Hindu and Muslim communalism, or any other for that matter, are rooted in the colonial interpretation of Indian history and in colonial policy. These ideologies claim to be indigenous, untouched by colonial thought, yet history does not bear this out. What is always described as religious confrontations in the past actually often had many other concerns, as it does to this day. The political interface between religion, society, and history in pre-colonial times has more recently begun to be studied in depth. And most of what is dressed up in the rhetoric of religious nationalism and claimed as indigenous thinking is in fact drawn from colonial ideas. The concern of identity politics is with contemporary events, but it seeks legitimacy from history, or rather its own version of history. And this, unfortunately, this version is becoming increasingly a fantasy. Let me give you a few examples of how history is mythologized. It is frequently said by those in authority and is therefore believed by many that Hindus have been victimized by the tyranny of Muslim rule and have been the slaves of the Muslims for the last thousand years. This is the reason given for some anti-Muslim sentiment today, justifying revenge. The destruction of the Babri Masjid, according to some politicians, was precisely to avenge the raid of Mahmud of Ghazni on the Somnath Temple, or at least that was one of the major reasons. This raid, it was said, led to the Hindus being traumatized, the raid of Mahmud, and to their victimization under Muslim rule. But curiously, Hindu texts of the second millennium AD, written in Sanskrit and Prakrit, do not refer to such a trauma or to being victimized. There are the usual references from texts of this period, the last thousand years, sometimes to amicable relations and sometimes to confrontations. This is common where two or more groups of people are living together. Such references also go back to pre-Islamic times. In fact, even to times before the invention of Islam. There is mention of hostilities, for example, between various religious sects, such as the Shaiva on the one hand, and the Buddhists and Jains on the other. Interestingly, the first reference to a Hindu trauma after Mahmud's raid on Somnath comes from a debate in the British Parliament in 1835. The theory of the trauma, as described by a member, a British member of Parliament, was then picked up by some Indians and entered the discourse on Mahmud. As to the victimization of Hindus by Muslim rule during the past 1,000 years, such, sta such a statement is contradicted by historical facts. Administration under Turkish and Mughal rule continued to employ upper caste Hindus. High-ranking Rajputs, in some cases, led the Mughal armies in campaigns 
and their loyalty was never questioned. The Rajput and Mughal elites intermarried. In fact, some historians have said that we should actually call it the Mughal Rajput period, because at least two of the Mughal kings had Rajput mothers, but never mind. To argue that Hindu culture was stymied by Muslim tyranny ignores uh, some of the finest developments in the Hindu religion. And this is something that always mystifies me. How can they make a statement like this about the last thousand years? These developments contributed to the richness and appeal of the Hindu religion and to that of Sanskritic culture. They date to the last thousand years and often were located in places under Muslim rule. It is not only incorrect, but perhaps also somewhat offensive, I think, to refer to the impressive authors of these texts in Sanskrit and Prakrit and their teachings associated with Hinduism in this period as people who were enslaved or victimized. In this connection, I would like to mention some Sanskrit commentaries that were written to clarify the Vedic corpus in the second millennium AD. For example, that of Sayana on the Rig Veda, written not too far away from here. The Ramayana and the Mahabharata were also the subject of many erudite commentaries, some fanciful, some very erudite. Compendia were written on the philosophical schools and were discussed in Brahman Mats which incidentally flourished during this period, as, for example, Madhvacharya's Sarva Darshana Sangraha. Vallabhacharya traveled north to Vrindavan and provided a topography of Krishna worship. He was the first person to say, this is where he was born, this is where he spent his childhood, this is where this event took place, and so on. The worship of Krishna had Muslim devotees as well by the 16th century the foremost amongst them being the great Ras Khan, whose verses are still sung in Hindustani classical music. The Ramanandins did the same for the worship of Ram at Ayodhya and marked out the sites in Ram's biography. New versions of the Ram Katha were written in the emerging regional languages, such as the Kritibas in Bengali, and Tulsidas's Ram Charitmanas in Hindi. Miniature paintings illustrating Hindu mythology and legends became extremely popular. They illustrated new manuscripts written in Sanskrit and Prakrit by Jain monks and Brahmin scholars, and also some written in Persian. Patronage for these came from royal courts of Rajas, Nawabs, and Sultans, in northern India and the Deccan. We, whenever we go to exhibitions of miniature paintings, for example, some of them are of the Mughal courts, but quite a lot of them, most of them, are actually from other courts. And the style is similar because there was a courtly culture. Patronage for these came, as I said, from the royal courts. Um, Jain and Brahman scholars were present at the court of Akbar and supervised the translation of Sanskrit texts into Persian, the most famous and the most talked about, of course, being the translation of the Mahabharata. This activity complemented the widely popular teaching of a range of bhakti saints, sons, translated as saints, teachings that gave new forms to popular Hinduism. They are often the forms that are observed and practiced in our times. The kind of religion we practice today is not the religion necessarily that goes back to Vedic times. It is what was uh, practiced and developed in the last thousand years. These were not the activities of victimized people. The authors of these texts and the bhakti teachers were people who were confident of their culture and religion. They went forth fearlessly to preach their religious ideas. They came from every level of society, from Brahmins to Jamars. 
and they had their own centers with large followings. These had as much dignity in society as those of the Sufi centers with whom there were conversations on religious matters. The irony of this statement that the Hindus were victimized for a thousand years is that the people who were actually victimized and have been so over the past 2,000 years were not the Hindus, but those that had been excluded by the caste Hindus and who continue to be so. These were the Avarnas, those outside caste, the untouchables, who had to live in ghettos, segregated from villages and towns, and were treated as genetically impure and polluted. We have to be very careful in assigning dis victimization, given that discrimination in Indian society against those regarded as being outside the boundary of caste was severe. Ideologies that give priority to a particular religious community contradict the existence of secularism. This again is a concept that we need to discuss far more fully than we have done, particularly for the Indian situation. During the national movement, secularism had a limited definition of referring to the coexistence of all religions. The danger to nationalism came from communal ideologies. The projection of establishing two states, the Islamic and the Hindu, each with a separate religious ideology, diverted support for the anti-colonial movement. And to avoid this, it was constantly said that all religions in India coexisted without any one of them having primacy. The edicts of Ashok Maurya, for example, were constantly quoted, the king stating that one must honor all religious sects. But coexistence alone is not secularism. What was not underlined was the more essential requirement that all religions must have equal status. Therefore, to give primacy to, to, to the Muslim in an Islamic state and to the Hindu in the Hindu Rashtra negates the very idea of secularism. An equally crucial feature is the relation between the state and the prevailing religions. In other words, how should the state function in relation to the activities of religious institutions? It seems to me that religion has two roles in society. One is that it is a private belief in a supernatural power who is concerned with the well-being of men and women. And this power often, but not always, takes the form of a deity. The worship may begin as a private act. But if there are enough worshipers, it can become a public act. The public act then encapsulates the public role of religion. It incorporates into religion something of a social activity. When a religion is formulated into a belief system and there are people who want to propagate it through patronage and finance, then it becomes a formal religion. These are the forms that we recognize from history and in current times when we speak of various religions. They gradually assert control over social institutions in various ways, through establishing and maintaining extensive places of worship, through educating children and young adults and socializing them in a way that they support the religion and its enterprises, and in establishing institutions other than at sacred sites, generally for teaching and preaching in order to propagate the religion. Once religions are formally established, they constitute their own laws regarding social norms. These become the rules by which their community functions. <clears throat> 
These rules often reinforce the political domination of the elite and of the orthodox that are necessary to such domination. In India, the laws of social functioning were stipulated in, for example, the Varnashram Dharm, the rules of caste, and Islam brought the laws of Sharia. Laws relating to birth, marriage, and inheritance are strengthened by associating them with divine sanction. However, sometimes the religious laws have to be subordinated to the practice of socially dominant groups. For example, in India, every formal religion, be it Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, or Sikhism, observes the broader laws of caste, particularly when it comes to rules of identity through birth, of marriage, who can marry whom, and rules of inheritance of property. Even more fundamental is the fact that we forget, is the fact that all these religions observe the laws of exclusion when it comes to the avarnas or the untouchables, referred to today as Dalits. Amongst Muslims and Christians outside India, West Asia, Europe, wherever, this discrimination does not exist but it does in India. That's something worth thinking about. The identity of the religious community is determined both by the beliefs it follows and the laws that it observes. There are, of course, many variations within a single religious system. All those that profess a particular religion are not identical. Intra-sect hostility is as familiar as inter-sect hostility among various Indian religions. We all know about the relationship between the Sunnis, the Sunnis and the Shias, for example. This explains in part that when nationalism demands the new identity, that of the citizen, as well as the subordination of the earlier identity of religion or caste, this demand can create problems. To be popular, pro pro properly secular, to be properly secular, the state should ideally not be involved with the functioning of any religious organization. And if it absolutely needs to, it must keep an equal distance from all. The civil society of a nation has to be secular. Civil laws, therefore, have also to be secular. Such laws would replace those that are linked to religious and caste identities and that conflict with civil laws. A properly secular state would not merge state office with religious authority, as is done these days, and would desist from appointing one person, the same person, to both state and religious offices. These are basic issues that we need to debate far more widely than we do. They concern the fundamental rights of citizens. Inevitably, secularism is also tied into how democracy functions in India. Let me take one example. We have not questioned the British construction of Indian society because we continue to endorse the idea that it consists of majority and minority communities all identified by religion. These ideas did not exist in pre-colonial times since there was no method of counting the numbers of each religious community. But in 1872, the British government held a census in some of their territories. Each person had to declare his or her religion. The majority was that of the Hindus, followed by Muslim, Christian, and other minorities. We as Indians accepted the division into majority and minority communities defined by religion and continue to do so. These have now entered the discussion on politics and democracy. 
But defining a community by the permanent identity of religion or caste and treating these as units of democracy is actually a negation of democracy. In a democratic polity, there are no permanent majorities or minorities. What makes up a majority is when a variety of unconnected individuals gather in support of the same opinion or action on a particular issue. So those making up the majority are likely to change with each issue under discussion. This means that there can be no permanent majority based on a single identity. When Nehru fought for adult suffrage in the 1950s, he wanted that each voter should use his or her vote in an independent manner. But subsequently, political parties used money and power to organize what we now call vote banks. The electorate is divided into caste or religious groups, and political parties seek their support by using these identities. The autonomy of the voter is curtailed by the control of the party and its payoffs, or by a belief that things will change for the good if a particular party is voted in. Using vote banks on a large scale is, in reality, a mechanism for undermining democracy. Let me conclude now by stating that much of what I have said is not new. These are issues that are being raised by people in various parts of the country. Those that speak of them are thoughtful people. They are seeking rational ways of understanding the change that we are undergoing in the process of becoming a nation. There is an anxiety about the insufficiency of public debate and discussion on questions relating to these changes concerning nationalism, secularism, and the functioning of democracy. A debate which I think is absolutely crucial and extremely necessary at this point in time. Implicit in this is also the concern for at least two other aspects of public life that we have neglected. These are firstly, how we educate our citizens to become independent citizens of the nation through the contents of what is taught in school and university, and through doing this through methods of questioning knowledge. And secondly, do our civil laws uphold the values of the kind of society that we aspire to? This is very much a debate and a discussion that needs to be conducted. These concepts that determine our socio-political life require us to understand what it means to be a secular democratic nation and how it is different from what there has been there before. The past should not be annulled, but we do not need a fantasy on the past. It has to be understood through a reasoned analysis and through logical conclusions. The concepts that I have spoken about cannot be reduced to slogans, because these do not help us to understand their values or how we can advance them. I have attempted to show the inherent intrinsic connection between nationalism, secularism, and democracy. The weakening or the erosion of any one of these inevitably reduces the effectiveness of the other two. And it is incumbent upon, upon us, therefore, to be aware of the integrated whole and how to realize it. Thank you.
thank you, Professor Thapa, for connecting these three concepts. Usually in the discourse, nationalism is not connected uh, with this and sometimes is also uh, seen as a competitive force with the rest of that. Uh, humanity in relation. But I think the way you have described it, they do seem to be connected in this manner. Uh, I uh, do have a few questions, but I don't think I should ask my questions first. Therefore, I invite questions from the, uh, from the audience. And now you can ma'am answer the question sitting, sitting down. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll uh, sort of point uh, people to you who, who want to ask questions. This is open for questions now, please. Don't tell me I've silenced all of you. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, Ma'am, in the way you have talked about nationalism, um, of course, it was very nice to hear again an affirmation of values which somehow seem to be silenced or getting, trying to be, people are trying to silence these values in this country today. Uh, so it, that was really very reassuring and encouraging to hear to talk, you talk about nationalism in this way. Uh, my question was about the conditions in which uh, you see uh, nationalism emerging. And you, uh, uh, as I understood, you are saying that nationalism is coming out of a particular set of processes, including industrialization, the emergence of the middle class, and such larger uh, secular processes. Um, how do you look at the role of culture in the, em in the emergence of uh, nationalism? Could it be that nationalism must necessarily locate itself with a particular culture, or is, can there be uh, more inclusive forms of uh, nationalism? Well, I, I think uh, it's, it, it's a very, very important aspect of nationalism because a lot of nationalism is built on cultural identities. The very fact that nationalism claims that it is carrying the entire culture with it, the culture of the, the society, of, of the, the ex-kingdoms and states that are going to form this new nation, means that there has to be an adjustment in cultures. You cannot have one culture dominating. And this is part of the problem with cultural nationalism, that there is a tendency for those that have always dominated, that belong to the right caste and the right class, the right patronage, to continue to dominate it. And it's very necessary, therefore, to assert that in the process of cultural nationalism, you have to carry a lot else. And not just carry it in terms of this is an item from this community, this is an item from that community, and so on. But show the integration of culture. I mean, culture, after all, uh, has its own history. In the 18th century, it was the uh, way in which the elite lived that was regarded as culture, in a sense. All of civilization is really the living of the pattern of life of the elite and so on. Then you get in the 20th century archaeology and anthropology coming in and saying, no, 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 culture is the pattern of life. And culture, therefore, is a term that you apply not just to a specific community or a specific class, but you apply it to, to, to people, you apply it to their pattern of living. Now, if you're going to take it to such a wide degree, and I, I agree with this definition, I think culture is a pattern of living, um, there are many, many aspects that have to be considered because they're integrated in that pattern of living, which is not so clearly visible, but becomes visible as you begin to investigate it and put it under a microscope and look at it more carefully. But I think it's very essential that if one is talking about cultural nationalism or the nationalism of culture, that you really do try and take in as much as is possible in these terms of being the integrated pattern of living. But some distinction, of course, has to be made. I mean, society is made up of divisions. You can't get rid of those completely. Yes, please. 
particular kind of a nationalism, let's say British nationalism or, or German nationalism, broadly West European or Western nationalism, mm. as opposed to a colonial uh, uh, nationalism which is driven by a colonial uh, uh, response, which generally results in a form of a cultural nationalism as in, say, India, or one could even use a number of African examples mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. tribal divisions mm -hmm. kind of form, uh, cohere to create a form of nationalism. So, so more broadly linking it to a, a, a primary idea of yours that history matters, do processes then determine the kind of nationalism that results? And uh, do these have different implications? Today in West Europe, Western Europe, it's more the othering is of uh, immigrants, immigrants, for instance. Whereas in India, it's somewhat slightly different. So just, mm. just a follow up on no, that. No, no, I, I, I think you're, you're quite right that there is a difference. And in fact, I didn't go into that because I, I don't feel competent enough to, to, not that I feel competent to talk about nationalism. It's essentially something that modern historians talk about. Um, but the, the cultural aspect is very important and is becoming important in some kinds of writing like um, um, post-colonialism, the cultural turn, the investigations that they have been doing of literature and culture and so on is very much to this point of, uh, you know, what happens to culture when it's meeting not just its own tradition, what has been regarded as its own tradition. Um, but I think, yes, the, the, it is a different situation because what you get in Europe is not only um, a kind of um, unbroken tradition of thinking about our culture, although there too, in the, the 18th and 19th century, the 19th century particularly, there is a going back to the roots of British writers. I mean, if you look at Scottish nationalism, for example, they're constantly going back to Scottish writers and Scottish history as a cultural articulation of their nationalism. Uh, but they're doing this within their own society because they have the colonial society to exclude. And they're pitching themselves against the colony. And that is why in the 19th century, a lot of the theories about the European is civilized, the non-European is primitive that civilized primitive dichotomy comes in, and the non-European is the colonized, therefore. The complication in, the, in, in all colonial cultures, you know, in all post-colonial cultures, is that there has been this period of colonialism. And in a sense, one doesn't know what to do with this. It's been implanted, we've taken it, it's germinated, it's been nurtured by the colonized society. But sometimes these questions come up, like the questions that are brought up all the time, that this is not indigenous. Your way of thinking is Western. Now, we can argue now that there is no such thing as my way of thinking is indigenous or my way of thinking is Western, because my way of thinking is my way of thinking, and we just analyze it that way. Uh, but this is a problem that comes up in ex-colonies, and it's quite interesting, Africa, the Caribbean again, very, very fascinating, because there you've had a, a complete mixture of people recently. Not like us, we've had our mixtures of people going over centuries, but they've had it all in the last 200 years. And now they are facing the same thing about cultural nationalism. What is their culture? And it is really quite interesting, the debates that are coming out from there. Uh, but yes, this is a question that one has to consider, that in, in our kinds of societies, uh, what do we regard as indigenous and what do we regard as, as foreign? I mean, this whole business about the Moors were alien is a load of nonsense at one level, absolutely. But how, how, are, you going to, how are you going to contradict that? I mean, apart from the fact that if you do it in a very intelligent way, the other party won't understand what you're saying. <laughs> but in any case, the point is you have to think these things out. And that is part of the crisis that, that all of us are facing, that when we are making these kinds of statements, what are we backing it up with? How are we thinking? So culture is a very important component of that. Yeah. Children. I wanted to ask 
So what, what? Economic determinants of nationalism. You know, what I meant was that our early nationalism, let's say from 1900 to 1950, was driven by the, an economic struggle against, against the problems of colonial order. But with glo globalization right now, that entire pattern has gone. And in fact, it's become very difficult for middle class, which you talk about, in today's globalized world to retain the uh, identity of, of nations. So nation, national, nationalism in a cultural sense and the lived reality of economics has been drastically transformed in many capitalist countries be because of globalization. Uh, so, that's, so therefore it ha is having an effect. And the second point that it seems to me is that the um, mini nationalisms, the religious, communal, etc., are often results of in insecurity. They get their, their fodder, their petrol from insecurities. And in, in effect, in today's globalized world, there doesn't seem to be a way to fight, fight it nationally with nationalism. It's getting fought in these microcosmic nationalisms. I thought you might want to comment. Uh, well, yeah, that, that is certainly, that's a point of view that uh, many of us who are old fashioned nationalists have had to contend with. Uh, that will nationalism survive? I think the main point really is that if you take nationalism seriously and you do produce a free citizenry with the rights that citizens can demand of a state, that's the first step. To go into globalization without that is really asking for disintegration. Once you have that, then you can go into globalization much more because then you know what it is you want from globalization. The other, the other aspect of globalization, of course, is uh, this, this is entirely something that I believe in and talk about and I get hit on the head frequently for talking that way, is that I think that globalization is also producing a sense of um, I must go back to my roots, which are my traditional roots. And I think a lot of the middle class, for example, the Indian middle class, which is becoming more and more religion-oriented, using religion in, in a kind of vulgar social sense, not the genuine thing, which is belief and faith and so on, but simply ostentation. And I think this is partly the insecurity of globalization that you're in a situation now where you really can't define yourself as a nation and you can't define yourself as an individual. And that insecurity is making you think, well, the only way I can define myself is to do more pujas and have more ostentatious weddings and, and you know, take out bigger religious processions and that kind of thing. So that return, yes, that acts against the idea of changing the identity to a citizen. But the sensible way of doing, of tackling globalization would be to talk about citizenship. Now, I think that one of the very interesting problems that Europe is facing today with immigration is what is it going to do with its uh, European community? Where you had a period of nationalism, you had intense hostility between Germany and France, for example. Then you had a period of nationalism and everybody came together and you had the European Union and people thought this would go on that is now on the point of collapse, what is going to replace it? And in each of these societies, you've got the struggle between you know, the ultra-right demanding that immigration be stopped and the immigrants who are there, there to stay, um, creating cultural problems, cultural nationalism again. I mean, what are you going to do with the cultures of these countries? It's like I was recently in London and there was speech after speech in Hyde Park saying, uh, what do they know about Alfred the Great? What do they know about King Arthur who burnt the cakes? How can we have people like that being called British? And then you sit there and say, my God, history comes into this again. But it's the cultural nationalism thing. It's, it is a very difficult problem at the moment. I mean, nationalism is in a crisis. But I do feel that in our kinds of countries that haven't been truly nationalistic yet, it might be useful to become truly nationalistic before we become post-nationalistic. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
So in true nationalism, the primary identity is citizenship. But I suppose for many people, they feel that their religion demands being the primary identity. Suppose I'm a Muslim, I take it that my whole self has to, has to be submitted to God, including my, my public self. So it almost sounds as if becoming an Indian citizen would mean having to revoke that sort of religion. Uh, presumably not right, but you can understand more about what it means to have the citizen as the, as the primary identity. Well, the primary identity is the identity that leads you to demand the rights from the state. That's really what primary identity is all about. That these, these are the rights that I have as a citizen. And these rights have to be given to me by the state. It's not that you're demanding that I need an, a, a madrasa f to educate my children. But the state has to provide education for all your children. It's a different kind of identity. No more questions? Yes, please. I thought I get a chance to ask mine. It's okay. No, 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 please, please go ahead. <laughs> Ma'am, uh, in a way, I see the whole discussion as a matter of watching a transition from inequality to diversity. Mm. Uh, nationalism is a transcendent form, mm. as is secularism. Now, when I began my studying career, when I was a young man, uh, inequality was the evil. And we were trying to look for a world that was moving towards a more equitable, a more equal world. As we grew up, and that world grew up, we found that equality actually translated into what we call homogeneity, what we might call uniformity. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is much discomfort with that. Mm. Now the problem is, how do I find a language in which I can express my discomfort with that transcendent form and express the needs of imminence, which are captured in diversity, but historically exist in a structural form in inequality. Nationalism for a while provided that vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But as it morphed into supranationalisms and subnationalisms, it lost its charm. So what is it now? What is the kind of language that we need to find? And what is the path that we need to move as we try to move from this inequality to diversity, not to equality? Because equality politically is often forming part of a baggage that is not so much egalitarian as homogenizing, uniformizing, and so on. I'm myself not fully uh, sure as to what the vocabulary is, but I realize that the problem somewhere is that we are not yet able to move from this point in where we be began around 30 years ago, and we know where we have to go in the future. I think part of the explanation would lie in um, what are the terms that you use for which kind of experience. Political and economic experience, yes, equality is absolutely fundamental. Um, the rights that you give to everybody have to be the same rights. Um, in terms of cultural nationalism, for example, I think diversity is an issue that needs to be considered. Diversity is important because it's by recognizing the diversity as being culturally legitimate that you can move towards some kind of integration, not equality. I'm not saying for a moment that there should be an equality of all cultural forms. You will continue to treat them differently as, as groups do. I mean, take artists today in the world who are doing paintings and sculpture and so on, they're, they're very unequal in terms of, uh, they're diverse in terms of styles and so on. But the thing is that you accept the legitimacy of each of these diversities to exist. 
and you accept their legis legitimacy to say that I am part of the cultural nationalism of my society. That's really as far as you can go. I don't think you can go beyond that. Inequality will exist. The point is to reduce it as much as possible, to make it as ineffective as possible in most spheres of life. And this is where I would argue very strongly that the first preference is rights, equal rights, rights of that kind. But diversity is yes, there's got to be diversity. There will be diversity. But let's not sort of say, oh, I mean, it's this argument that I was having the other day with people who were talking about the difference between art and craft. Now, this is a form of diversity. It's a form of inequality. You take art seriously. You have exhibitions, and you, people pay fortunes to acquire a painting. Perfectly beautiful objects are produced by craftsmen, and you say, oh, that's craft, and set it aside. Now, you can argue that the two things are different, that the two experiences are different, therefore they have, that difference has to be conceded. On the other hand, you can just say, well, all right, they're different, there is a diversity, but they have an equal right to be present. And we have to be aware of the fact that there is this diversity. So I don't think equality necessarily means homogeneity. I mean, it would be a very boring world if it did. I certainly wouldn't support it. OK, since there are no more questions, therefore, ma'am, could I ask mm, one or two very? You see, one thing uh, which actually uh, somewhat, uh, perhaps Purnendu at the deeper level might have been hinting at that, that uh, when one talks of uh, identity as a citizen in the nation, and there are other identities, then often the other identities come in conflict with that. And if one thinks from the communitarian angle, mm -hmm. then uh, there seems to be value in being part of any community, and then, then there, is, there is a conflict uh, in that. And uh, I think you resolve that in that uh, saying that uh, uh, rights are equal, but there could be cultural or, or other differences. Yeah, yeah. But in India, it seems to me uh, that the communitarian identity and the national identity are in great conflict even at this moment, and how do we go beyond that? That's, um, ma'am, one or two more. I just want to, I, did I hear you correctly when you say that uh, state needs to have equal distance from all religion, then are you actually hinting that the Sarva Dharam Sambhav is actually an inadequate conception mm, I, uh, of, of uh, uh, secularism? Yes, I think the, exist, the equality of all religions, the coexistence of all religions is one step, the equality of all religions is the next step, and the third is that Given a state, a state must have an equal relationship with all religions, yes. So truly secular state is a equally truly distant, yes. Yes. and the earlier yes. two might yes. be progressions yes. in that direction, right. but not no, yet no, reached. No. And that is why I think that we stop at coexistence, or the most we take it up to the equality of all religions, but that's not sufficient, in my thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Bhupenji, what, uh, where is Bhupenji? What, what are we supposed to be doing now? <laughs> Do you want to say something or? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much friends for b being such a wonderful uh, audience and thank you very much ma'am for uh, you. your presence and enlightening us on these, uh, these concepts. Uh, I think this was a very good occasion. Thank you very much. <laughs>